to all of us that the Lord has given me. It's another little thought that we will leave. You know, district missionary, I'm not supposed to leave a thought. But I want to say, let's be fruitful. Let's be fruitful. Allow me today to begin this message by saying fruitfulness plays a major role when we're talking about the kingdom of God fruitfulness plays a major role in existence fruitfulness plays a major role in existence amen Fruitfulness. Another way perhaps I could say this is you really want God, you really want to give God a reason to keep you here. While I'm talking about this, just ask yourself, what reasons do the Lord have? to keep me here. I, mean, I want to be here, but what, what benefit am I to the kingdom or to the cause of Christ? My pastor was an extraordinary man of God. I learned so much from him. I'm almost like what Ruth said to Naomi said in the book of Ruth your God shall be my God your people shall be my people your ways are my ways I learned his ways there was a young man standing there who wanted prayer the person was sick I'll never forget and Elder Turner said to the person if I pray for you and the Lord heal you will you serve the Lord man said, no, I'm not ready yet. Elder Turner said, go sit down. A few years later, it was my turn. Different man, same situation. I said, I will pray for you. I will lay hands upon you. But if God does this miracle for you, will you give your heart to the Lord and will you serve the Lord? The person said to me, I'm not ready yet. I said to them, go sit down. Preacher, that was cruel. No, that was smart. It's biblical. Do you not know that we're saved for a reason? Yes, the Bible says that we are saved to show forth yes, the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that we should show forth the praise of him who saved us. When the Lord saves us, we're saved for a reason, for purposes. The Bible says for his pleasure thou art and worked created now I know that we all feel and believe that we are the centers of our universe and we often say this is my life and uh, it's for me to do what I want with it and all of that and we are large and in charge but Revelation chapter 4 verse 11 says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. 
for thou for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created we exist because it pleased him to make us and the lifestyle that pleases God is holiness. You know, I said this Thursday night, and I'll say it again. And some of you got quiet when I brought it up. But we're in a day now where people are calling holiness bondage. We're not, we're not in bondage. Okay, so that means you're free to put tattoos all over your body. Free to wear your pants hanging off your rear end. And I'm not talking about anybody. You know, when I talk about this, I'm not talking about anyone who may have a tattoo now. If, if, if it's already there, it's there. But I'm talking about adding more. I showed them Thursday night in the Bible where God says, thou shalt put no markings on your body. He says, for I am the Lord. That's, that's Bible. Um, I still happen to have it. Leviticus 19 and 28. Now I know that uh, if a thing is not popular, we try to pretend that it's not in the scripture. But it's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. And you know what? We have to be careful how we try to cherry pick the scripture. The Bible says, and uh, uh, well, that, that, that was the Old Testament, that was the law. Uh, when I hear pastors say that, all right, bring you all, bring you all the tithe into the storehouse was Old Testament too. Rev, you want them, don't you? <laughs> Thou shalt not commit adultery was Old Testament. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God said, let there be light. Well, let's talk about it. Your favorite scripture. I know the thoughts that I think toward you. <laughs> thoughts of evil. Thoughts of good, not of evil. And to bring you to an expected end. That's Old Testament. All right. So now let's, let's read this one. God said, and, uh, uh, and I don't want anybody to get comfortable and leave. Listen, I'm for you. But I'm trying to show you something. If you all will pray with me. Um, verse 28 says, you shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead nor print any marks upon you. And then the Lord gave the reasons. He says, for I am the Lord. He said, don't do it because I've told you not to. I made you. You didn't make me. I created you. Do with your body what I have told you to do with it. Don't do with it what I tell you not to do with it. That's Bible. I feel like, I feel like we went from being up room to a Lutheran church. You know, so quiet. And so people, people now are saying that, uh, back to my point, that holiness is bondage and we're free, we're free. Uh, I said Thursday night that preachers have actually said, now, we're not going to talk about homosexuality and we're not going to talk about abortion and stuff like that. My question would be, why? Why wouldn't you? The world is certainly talking about homosexuality. They're shoving it down your throats. It's in every commercial. It's in every movie. It's everywhere. They're pushing it. The politicians are pushing it. And when people say they're not going to talk about it, that people's problem is not talking about it. People's problem now is talking against it. So they backslid. You've caved in. You ain't no good. You need to quit. 
You need to leave the ministry. You've caved. You're part of the falling away. It ain't that you don't want to talk about it. You're for talking about it. You're just afraid to talk against it. Amen. That's good preaching right there. That's good preaching. Um, we're, we're, going to, we're going to make our church look like a club. Amen. And the crosses are gone and all of the things that would indicate that you're in a church house and we want to have club church and put the diamond in the sky and smoke machines. This, the, the, that movement is called the spirit of modernity. And modernity is a actual literal movement where anything that is ecclesiastical, anything that remind you of the church, the way of the church, that distinguishes the church and brings in the liturgical aspects of the church. They are trying to get that out of the church so that the church will look secular. The word secular by definition literally means non-religious. So how do you have a non-religious church? It's a church. The Old, the Old Testament word for secular is the word profane. The New Testament word for secular is the word unholy. And Paul said among the things that men would be in the last days, lovers of themselves and all that, he mentions in there unholy, which literally is secular. So the preacher now won't want to look like he's not a preacher. The church singer won't want to look like a pole dancer. All up leading praise and worship in tights. Ain't no man got his mind on praising the Lord and and he can see all of your curve. You shot you 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 looking like that. If that brother can still see Jesus, something wrong with him. Sissy. Man, man. man can't see past all that. Say, man, I don't even see it. You, you, you either a liar and you're going to hell, or you're homosexual and you're going to hell. Either way, you lost. Yeah, either way. I'm moving, I'm moving away from them. Mm -hmm. I'm headed somewhere. God made us. He gave us this life. He gave us our bodies. Amen. And he gave us as a lifestyle that God has for man. It's called holiness. The Bible says, follow peace with all men in holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Jesus says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. It's free to be all that Jesus would have you to be. And one of the things that puts us well on the road after we get saved to becoming holy is that we bear fruit. We bear fruit. We began to grow. We began to improve. The effects, the results of Jesus being in our lives began to show. Places that I used to go, I don't go no more. The things I used to do, I don't do anymore. The lies I used to tell, I don't tell anymore. The places, you know, you change. And even if you find yourself in a rut, you don't stay there. You allow God to begin to work out your salvation. You know, the Bible says grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, uh, the, the, the point that I want to show you is that if there is no growth, if there is no fruitfulness, if there is, are no improvements over time, if you don't let the Lord make you better, and brother, I'm proud of what God's doing in you. Extremely proud. Extremely proud. I, I like what God's doing now, young men. I'm extremely proud. Fruitlessness can have a major effect on your existence. I'm going to preach. Fruitlessness.
righteousness invites the judgment of God. What we're going to see in this study today is that executions and accidental deaths are not definitive signs of God's judgment. Executions and accidental deaths. When people die accidentally. Things happen. That's not necessarily God passing judgment on someone. A Christian dies in a car crash. The true Christian who knows that that Christian who pass in that accident, if you know that they were a true Christian, then you don't spend your time talking, well, I guess, well, maybe God judged them. That's why they got killed. No, no, accidents happen. You, 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 hear, these, you hear people say things that, that aren't wise. You know, People say, you know, in God, there are no coincidences. The Bible teaches time and shit. chance happens to all. Chance, things happen. Executions, if God allows a Christian to be executed, God have allowed Christians to die from COVID, where God has spared others. We cannot assume that the Christian who died, that their death was God bringing judgment. And the Christian who lived, well, that was God saying, you're all right with me. Why are you bringing this up, preacher? Uh, it's germane to the text because it sets the context of our text. Yes, sir. Verse 1 says, there were present at that season some that told Jesus of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Some Galileans were sacrificing to the Lord and Pilate, a political figure, killed them. And uh, as they were sacrificing, their blood was mingled with their sacrifices. And to know the context of the story that was told, we know the context of it based on our Lord's response. I need you to follow me now. I'm headed somewhere. My friends on Facebook, YouTube Live, follow me. Our Lord said to them, suppose ye, he looked at, he looked, he looked at them and says, do you think that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things which tells you that that is exactly what they were thinking oh yeah Pilate killed them because they were such bad sinners he killed them and their sacrifice Jesus says do you think what happened to them because they were sinners more sinful than most Galileans Jesus looked at them and he says I'll tell you right now no that's not why this happened to them. And I'll tell you something. Except you repent. He called them sinners. The people who told the story. You shall likewise perish. He said their condition, they were not so sinful that their sin brought this upon them. Then Jesus did something else. He said to show you that I read the paper. And I keep up with what's going on in society. He said, you've told me one story. Let me tell you one. Verse four, all those 18 upon whom the tower of Shalom fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelleth in Jerusalem? Do you think that the fate, their fate was because they were worse than you? Do you think, my friends, that the tower in Miami that collapsed, that those people who died were, they died because they were worse than we are? 
Jesus says, no, you, you can't assume through an execution or through an accident that you're looking at the judgment of God. He says, so I say to you, except you repent, you will likewise perish. He let all of them know, none of you have been so holy that your holiness is why an accident didn't take place. Are you following me? Now watch me connect this. He says, but I want to show you something that will definitely invite the judgment of God. There is something that you can do or something that you can fail to do that will draw God's judgment your way. Remember, Fruitlessness or fruitfulness plays a role in our existence. We need to know that no matter how patient God, how patiently God waits for the fruit to appear, giving people every possible chance to produce fruit, people cannot put off that day forever idly thinking that it will never come. Judgment comes. Judgment comes. The thing that we can do that will cause the judgment of God, hear me well, to come our way is to be fruitless too long. To fail to grow when you ought to grow. To fail to know what you ought to have known. To fail to catch on when you've been given ample time to catch on will cause the judgment of God to come your way. So to teach this lesson, after they had brought up what Pilate did to the Gadareans, the Galileans, excuse me, and he brought up what happened uh, to those 18 upon whom the Tower of Shalom fell, he says, let me teach you something. You know, Jesus uh, is called the master teacher. Amen. He's, he was the, he's the unequal teacher. The world's greatest teacher is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And, and he's more than a teacher. He's God incarnate. He's God in the flesh. But oh, what a teacher he was when he walked the earth. And what a teacher he is. People have strong feelings about their teachers. It has been said that if someone makes us think that we are thinking, we love them. But if a teacher really makes you think, you don't like them at all. The challenge of biblical Christianity, the challenge of good preaching is not just to get you to say amen, but to get you to think about what's being said. God is saying something. I want you to Think about it. I want you to hear it. You know, um, one uh, man said this concerning his love for his teacher. The teacher ran a stoplight. And by the time that teacher ran this particular stoplight, the teacher's student, I guess she taught the kid in elementary school, had become a judge and the teacher came before the judge guilty of having run a stoplight. The judge said to the teacher, I have waited for years for this opportunity. I sentence you to going over and sitting in that corner and writing 100 times, I will not run a stoplight. 
teachers. Good teachers are a blessing from God. Bad teachers are a curse from the devil. Jesus was a teacher. He spoke in parables. A parable is a comparison of a spiritual thing to a natural thing so that the spiritual thing can be better understood. If you read at your leisure in Matthew's gospel chapter 21 and in Luke's gospel chapter 11, you read what Jesus actually walked up to a fig tree. But in Matthew's gospel chapter 21 and in Mark's gospel, Mark, excuse me, chapter 11, these were not parables. Matthew and Mark's account, they were not parables. Jesus actually walked up to the fig tree uh, seeking to find figs. In, in, in the context of Luke, Jesus is telling a story, giving an illustration to teach a lesson. Are you following me? So, so he spoke in this parable, amen, to show uh, what actually will bring upon all of us God judgment so the text says a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard I know I'm starting real slow but every little nugget that I drop will make sense as we continue now in dealing with this parable I don't want to make the mistake that that's often made with parables when you read the parable of our Lord Really, our Lord is not trying to make 10 points in a parable. He's actually trying to make one. And sometimes we miss the point of a parable because we overanalyze the parable. We take it too far. It's just like people do with the parable of the 10 versions. The Bible says five was wise, were wise, five were foolish, and all of them waited till the bridegroom came and the Bible says that all 10 of them fell asleep waiting for the, the, the announcement to be given, right? Now there's no point in you spending all your time trying to figure out what uh, they all 10 fell asleep means. So that means that the whole church backslid. They all fell asleep. No, that ain't, that's not his point. The point that he's making is that you want to be ready when Jesus comes. You don't know when he's coming. And when he comes, make sure you have oil enough to last. That's the point. If you try to go in too many directions, you'll miss the point. And then when we think about the butchery of what, what has been done to the parable of the sower. Now, some of my preacher friends are going to get upset, but I'm going to tell you, Rev, the parable of the sower has nothing to do with the offering. It has nothing to do with giving money. The parable of the sower has something to do with you. It's about the listener. It's not about the preacher. It's about the listener. And it teaches that there are basically four kinds of listeners. Wayside, thorny heart, stone-filled heart, and good ground. Right. And what determines what kind of person you are is how you respond to the word of God. When it is preached, everybody listens, but not everybody responds the same way. It depends on the kind of person you are. Some rejoice when they first hear it and get happy, but because they don't get any roots, they're in the stones. They don't last long. Some in the thorns allow the cares of this life to choke the word out of them. Some represent those, those uh, seeds that fell by the wayside. You, you just pay the word any attention. And then there is the optimum. The person whose 
heart is ready for the truth. They're called good ground. And the seed germinates in them. And they bring forth some 30, some 60, and some 100 fold. They get blessed because their heart is right. See, whether or not you say amen, it ain't, it, that's no reflection on me. See, I'm not confused. That's a reflection on you. If your heart is right and you hear the truth, you'll say amen to the truth. You'll obey the truth. If the truth makes you get up and walk out, that's not an indictment on the church. That's not an indictment on the preacher. That's an indictment on you. You don't want the truth. Well, you have a stony heart or a thorny heart or maybe the seeds fell by the wayside. You better not die. Don't you think that people would get more out of the parable of the soil if they explained it that way? Because that's, that's the way Jesus explained it. Then, trying to make everybody think, ah, uh, if you could just bring this seed and, and this ministry is good ground and this place is good ground. I'm not saying that they're not, but that's not the point of that parable. And it's better to preach the point than to try to make up one. God don't need you to gild the lily. The truth of God stands on its own. You had to help God out. So was that like, what did the song say? God don't need no matches. There's a whole lot of double negatives in that. God don't need no matches. He's fouled by himself. So let, let me, I got to move on. Let me preach this today. I'm taking too long. I'm trying to lift this foundation. I don't want to go off into the weeds, but, and somebody may say, well, you've already done that. <laughs> But we do need to see the place of mercy and goodness and the grace of God that is displayed in this parable because goodness, mercy, and grace big time is displayed in this parable. We need to see just how patient the Lord is with his people. In his uh, postponing judgment. In the postponing of judgment. Not only is God patient in postponing judgment with the nation of Israel and with the church and with us as individuals, but the God of the Bible is patient in postponing judgment with everyone. Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, that is his promise that he will return, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, Lord, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You know, I know we're all praying saying, come Lord, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Lord, why won't, you, why won't you come right now? God, I've been praying and fasting for you to come. Come, Lord. And the Lord has an answer to your question. God says, I haven't come back yet because I don't want any to perish. Right. Then the Lord will add, that's why I didn't come back before you got saved. You, I could have. I could have. But I waited on you. And the Lord is delaying his coming, waiting on sinners to come in. Why is the Lord waiting? Number one, he knows the good things that he has prepared for all who give their hearts to him. And he knows how bad hell is for all who miss out. Hell is so bad that Jesus don't want anybody to perish. Now the Bible says not willing that any should perish. Did I just read that? Did I read that right? Not willing that any should perish. Any. He doesn't even want the child molester to perish. He don't want the serial killer to perish. He don't want the thug to perish. He don't want the, 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 the homosexual, the, the person who participates in incest, people who do 
things that are too heinous to even talk about. He doesn't even want them to perish. He's delaying that all men might be saved. Now, many of them are going to perish because they won't repent, but he's waiting because he loves us so. Let me tell you something. You don't want to go to hell. You don't want to go to hell. If it's that bad, you would think that the law, that there are certain things, some of these sins I just mentioned, that the Lord would hurry up and come back so that he could get them. But he says, no, even for them. Maybe, somehow, they'll hear the word and let me save them because this place was not prepared for you. Hear me, Facebook Live, YouTube Live saints here. The Bible teaches that hell is prepared for the devil and his angels. Don't you end up in, up, down, down there forever. Then you'll understand why Jesus waited so long. You'll understand why he didn't want anybody to go to that place. I'm not going. I'm going where Jesus is. I'm not going. I'm not, I'm not going. Ain't no woman worth that. Ain't no man worth that. Praise the Lord. No drugs. No opportunity. Oh, no. The world, you can have all of the yachts. You can have all of the, uh, the, the jets. You can have the fame. You can have it all because it's all temporary anyway. I'm... I'm going up yonder to be with my Lord. That's where I'm going. Ain't nobody worth being lost over. I just want to experience. No, 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 no. You don't want to go there. You don't want to go there. You don't want to go there. The patience of the Lord tells us that you don't want to go there. See, see there's too many, there's too many wicked folk that, that you would think that he would just come so he could make sure that they go there. He's giving them time. People that whom we wouldn't give time. That's why we're asking the Lord, come on. And the Lord is looking at us saying, but suppose I would have come when your grandma was calling on me, when you were out there. But now listen, are you praying for me? But listen, God will not postpone judgment forever. Praise the Lord. Not for Israel. Not for the church, not for us as individuals, and not for the world. For verse 10 of 2 Peter chapter 3 says, but the day of the Lord will come. It will come. It will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Y'all talking about climate change. The elements shall melt with fervent heat. And the earth also and the works that are therein, the Bible says, shall be burned up. Yeah. All of these monuments to permanency, big bridges that seem to be so uh, unmovable that they will last forever, skyscrapers that you can't bring down, all of these monuments to permanency, all of them going down. Everything you see has a time stamp on it. When you're out enjoying nature, look at it and be grateful. But just know, time's running out on it. Sometimes on my way home, as on my way, I thank God as I drive to my home, I say, Lord, I thank you for your blessings, but don't, I don't care how well that yard may be manicured. It ain't gonna last forever. 9-11 mm -mm. showed us that buildings fall. Praise the Lord. And when you look up at the sky, as beautiful as it is, and you look up there, you see the North Star, the Big Dipper, the Little Dipper. You see the heavens, the Milky Way. You see all of the things, the, the constellations and all that, the sun and the moon. The Bible says all of that. And it's, oh, says it shall melt with fervent heat and says it shall pass away with a great noise. You talk about something one day that's gonna be something so cataclysmic that it will split the ears. So he tells us that the final judgment will not be postponed forever. 
the day of the Lord will come. Yes. And everything, uh, the Jehovah Witness said that the earth is going to be burnt off. The Jehovah Witness is going to be burnt up and you with it if you don't get right with God. Yes. Say amen, somebody. Yes. Say amen, somebody. Yes. Now let's look at uh, the benefit that this tree had. Are you praying for me? Yes. You know, when I think about the benefit of this tree, I think about the benefit that we have as a people in this country. Right. Do you see me turn that corner that fast? God has been so good to us. Yes, yes. Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan gave a report in 1965. He was part of the Johnson administration. And at the time he gave the report, the report was deemed racist. They dismissed it. And at that time, only 25%, or maybe 20%, 20% of black children was born out of wedlock. Now less than 20% are born in wedlock. Isn't that bad? The numbers are almost flipped to that degree. And depend, depend upon the age group, 18 through 22, 18 through 25, the, the numbers are worse. Right. And he talked about how this behavior, are you praying for me? Yes, sir. Would reverse the gains that we have gained through civil rights. And he introduced a term. He talked about something that's called Defining deviancy down. Defining deviancy down. Say it with me. Defining deviancy down. Now you know what deviant behavior is. The way that it works is, here's the philosophy. And uh, by the way, I agree with it. As people see Deviant behavior, more and more and more. The more often that we see it, the less deviant it appears to be because we see it all the time. Now, the context that Monahan, Senator Monahan, was using was that of unwed births. Today, we have defined deviancy down to the point that that doesn't seem unusual anymore. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for that. See, some of y'all wouldn't say I was telling the truth, but you, you know I know I'm telling the truth. You know that. See, you wouldn't know he's telling the truth. Say amen. amen. And this is, not, uh, this is not a judgment on anybody because I tell you often, I was born out of wedlock. I thank God that I'm here. But, I'm making a point. When this happens, the child is seven times more likely to drop out of school, many times more likely to end up in poverty. All of the negatives go toward that child. What do we do? We spend our time marching for critical race theory. Out there marching on George Floyd. That ain't our problem. Our problem is that we have defined deviancy down. The black man who used to be viewed as the strong man, dingo, he's a strong man. Look at the brother today. He's viewed as a homosexual. It ain't nothing to see him on television acting like a sissy, acting all effeminate, dressed in all kinds of funny colors. And ain't nobody sh shocked defining Deviant sit down. His pants is hanging off of his rear. I remember when that first broke out, everybody's jaw hit the ground. We knew that wouldn't last. We knew that wouldn't last because no intelligent human being would walk around showing their drawers in public, constantly pull, pulling up their pants. And they ain't nowhere in this world. You could, you could learn to walk wide-legged to hold your pants up. And, and you know, you look like a, a dwarf. No intelligent person. Y'all don't like my preaching. That this, 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 this thing won't last. It won't last. 
it won't last. It lasts. It's alive today. Why? Because we have defined deviancy down. When deviancy is defined down, the further it goes, the less likely it is for us to find the hope to turn it around. To turn it around. See, we, we wanna, we want, we, we're being de deflected. We're being, we're being fooled. Black folk are being fooled. America is not perfect, but it is exceptional. It is exceptional. Prove it. Why do you think everybody's trying to get in? Talk to the Mexicans. Talk to the Hispanics. Talk to the folk coming up from Guatemala. Talk to the people coming up from Africa. Talk to people. Talk to people. Everybody wants to be an American. It's still the land of opportunity. We ought to be ashamed that in the public school system, Hispanic uh, uh, kids outpace African Americans. And six months ago, they were in the desert crossing illegally. Six months later, they're making better grades than you. We're being told the wrong stuff. We're told that, they're, they're, that we have no advantages when God has placed us in the most advantaged place on earth for people who look like us. America have more black millionaires. America have more, listen, people of African descent uh, who have the money and the power, the more of them live in America than anywhere else in the world. In the world. In the world. And yet we're being taught not to appreciate our advantages. We're being taught to be angry. We're being taught to blame everyone else. I'm going to preach in just a minute. We're being taught that a black man can't make it. And we see all them black millionaires run up and down basketball courts of all places. Run up and down football fields. Praise the Lord. They're doing good. All in politics, fooling you, making you think that you need them to give you a government handout. They are so scared that you will discover one day that they'll never be able to give you the kind of money you can make on your own. They are so afraid. Oh my Lord. We can't let them figure out that, that, that no black person should be out marching talking about we need to do something about the minimum wage. What are you doing having been here 45 and 50 years of your life? You should be so far ahead that minimum wage should cross your mind no way. Why are, you, why are you that far behind? Why is that an issue at 55? Well, we need to get a job that pay us a living wage. Why don't you have one? What moves did you make? What moves didn't you make? What did you do when you went to school? Why are you so dumb? I mean, Hispanics got, they got, they got two or three credit unions. Everywhere you look, credit unions, everything going up. They're building credit unions and the, and the government is building jails to put us in. Oh, I done got mad. You know I'm right, you know I'm right. You know that I'm right. I want to encourage you today to take advantage of the, uh, uh, take advantage of the benefits that God has given you, you young folk. Be wise. Listen to me now. Don't throw your life away. Don't take but one bad decision. And you messed up. Praise the Lord. Well, I don't like the way he preached. I'm going to walk out. Sit down and listen. There ain't nothing you can do for me but I can help you. Sometimes people rebel. I don't want to even hear that. But you're the one who's broke. You're struggling. You got to get there. Praise the Lord. I've been here 60 years. Ain't much you can do for me, but there's a whole lot that I can do for you. Praise the Lord. I don't like some of them people at the upper room. You go there, you got to dress a certain kind of way. You got to look. You don't have to dress any kind of way. Just come to church. But if you if you do see a collection of people who seem to be successful, I would think you'd want to be around them. Because they know something I don't know. Here I am gang 
you for a living. Maybe you should hang out with somebody who can show you a more excellent way. Maybe if they're willing to help you, you ought to give some advice since you don't seem to know how to figure it out yourself. This tree had advantages. Did I tell you that Jesus was a master teacher? Notice what the master teacher said. See, the master teacher makes you think. You got to get it. You can't learn the lesson from a master teacher yawning. You got to pay attention. You got to wake up. Jesus drops a bomb in the opening statement. He said, I'm talking about boom. Oh, God. He dropped the bomb. He said, a certain man had a fig tree planted in a vineyard. A fig tree planted in a vineyard. I said a fig tree planted in a vineyard. Matthew Henry said, the advantages which this fig tree had. It was planted in a vineyard. It was planted in superior soil where it would receive more care than any other kind of fig tree. Show them the fig tree. See, fig trees were so plenteous uh, in Palestine that they grew on the side of the road. Remember when Jesus was on, Matthew 21, 19, Jesus was on the way, uh, he was walking and he saw a fig tree. The Bible says he saw it in the way. Matthew 21, 19, that is, just show that fig tree. He saw the fig tree on the side of the road. They were everywhere. Notice this fig tree that I'm showing you. That fig tree is not in a vineyard. That fig tree is in a, hill, in a field, in an uncultivated place. They were everywhere. It just, it just grew. But this fig tree, this particular one, this fig tree uh, had uh, intentionality behind it. God bless young brother Gillespie. Good to see you, man. Fine young man. His daddy is one of our writers. Praise the Lord. Mama's an evangelist. I call his daddy the navigator because he gets us through. And that fine young son of his, we just love him. He was hanging out with us the other day and made us all feel like old men. <laughs> Fine young man. Doing good. Fig trees were everywhere. Can I preach? But this one, this one had intentionality behind it. Somebody wanted it to live. Somebody took it and planted it in good soil, choice soil, and took care of it. Yes, you're not just some little stray fig tree out there, but you are a fig tree that has all of the advantages. Let me tell you something. God have given all of us certain advantages by just allowing us to be born here. Thank you for not allowing me to be born in India. Thank you, Lord. I may have been born in a, had I been born there, I'd be born in a caste system. And if you're my complexion, you third caste. In other words, you, you, you were born nothing. You ain't gonna be anything and there's no way to become something. So you ought to thank God you weren't born in India. Oh, I wanna go over there and see Taj Mahal. They'd have you over there cleaning the bathroom. Wherever it is. <laughs> Y'all don't like my preaching? You see, you, there are places in this world. See, you think you know racism. Americans don't know racism. Now, there are some places in this world where, oh, my people would love to be here with the improvements. God have given us certain advantages. One of the advantages is we can come in here and worship. <sighs> we'll see how long that lasts, though. Because we're, we're, in a, we're in a bad, we're in a crazy day. We're in a crazy day. 
And uh, let me just say this, and then I'm going. Then I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm going to bring it home. If somebody get rock and rock. We're going to get on the organ and go home. But uh, let me just say this to you. I, you know, God, God, there's so much to be said because we're doing so much. Our nation is violating the law, violating Nuremberg codes. In 1947, the law was passed. You can't make people take medicine. You can't suppose. You're not supposed to coerce people into taking anything. If people don't want to, that's supposed to be people's choice. And we're living in a day now where uh, they are trying to make it, trying to force you. Now, let me tell you, whether you take the shot or not, that is your business. I'm one of the few preachers that treats his members and his listeners like they have brains. Now, the rest of the preachers, a lot of them not teach, teach you like that. They're trying to tell you, come on and take the shot. You need to do this. You need to do that. And then Rev get on there and show you him taking the shot like that's supposed to influence you. And ain't nobody worse than celebrities. I wouldn't follow a celebrity out the door if the building was on fire. Why would you be, in, be in, influenced by a celebrity? Half of them are just as wicked and godless and immoral as ever. I was in the store the other day and I saw a television and I, I was looking at it and saw uh, that uh, Dwayne Wade was, was sponsoring a TV from China, had his picture on it. I said, I'm not buying it. I'm not buying anything sold by a pitch man who raises his son as a girl. That's enough right there. That's enough right there. Patrick Wooden ain't going to, you ain't going to influence me. Well, I don't see it that way. I didn't say you. Me, me, I'm not going to be influenced by that. If you had a, a, a daughter, brother, and you were raising your daughter as a son, I'm through with you. And we just blow smoke and do whatever we got to do. But I'm done. I'm done. Because I have no respect for you. That's child abuse. That's child abuse. That's child abuse. And a good father wouldn't do it. A good man wouldn't have that. Well, I'm going too far. A decent guy wouldn't. A decent guy wouldn't fall for that. Are you praying for me? So, praise God. I, look, I'm fired up about this. See, because we're living in a world where they're trying to get us. So the, these people are trying to make people take the shot. The Biden administration is trying to consider whether or not you can have interstate travel without showing whether or not you've had the shot. Some businesses will let you in if if you can show us that you had the shot, or you gonna order out. I'm not, look, if, if, if you're going to do that to me, you're not going to get my money. Listen, whatever you decide to do, that's your business. That, that's not my point. My point is, the government is beginning to practice tyranny. Tyranny. We're, we're seeing fascism. The alignment of government, education, and medicine, and everybody speaking the same language and business to get people to do something. And if you don't, they try to shame you, shame you online, try to shame you, try to put you down. Well, I'm not ashamed. Ain't no bunch of losers gonna shame me. I'm grown. If I decide to do it, that's my business. If I don't, that's my business. I'm not ashamed. But I wanna say something to you smug, smug leaders out there who are being silent as tyranny begins to reign. I heard the great Lutheran preacher Niemöller who stood up against Hitler. His words rang true. He said when they came after the socialists, he said, I said nothing because I was not a socialist. Right. He said, then they came after the trade unionists. And I said nothing because I was not a trade unionist. Then he said, next they came after the Jews. And I said nothing because I was not a Jew. Then he said, 
Then they came after me. And there was no one left to speak for me. They are showing you, preacher, how they're going to come after people to make people take the mark of the beast. And if you don't speak up now, if you don't say something now, the day will come when they will come after you. And there won't be no wooden. There won't be no upper room. There won't be anybody left to speak up for you because you were silent when it mattered. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Well, whether, whether you are for uh, putting that vaccine, that's what they call it, in your body or not, that's your business. But you ought, you ought to be against this. You ought to be against this. This tyranny will try to threaten somebody got churches being given letters where the saints can't enter their church unless they've been vaccinated. If I ever give you that, you ought to leave the church. Right. What, whatever happened to believe in God, whatever happened to, to God's house being called the house of prayer, where COVID is so contagious, it wasn't more contagious than leprosy. And Jesus went out and laid hands on the leper and the leper called healing. The Bible said by his stripes, we are healed he's a healer and I'm going to tell you something ain't none of us going to live forever people die people die but I heard the Lord say don't fear him who can destroy your body and afterwards there's no more than they can do so, but I'll tell you who to fear fear him who can destroy the body and put the soul into hell. I don't know about you, but I think I'm going to keep my hands in the Lord's hand. Oh, Lord. Can I get a witness in here today? I'm, I'm going to trust in the Lord. And my saying, I'm going to trust in the Lord, that's not cold to say I'm going to take a shot or not take a shot. That's, that's, that's not what I'm trying to lead you. What I am saying is this tyranny that government is doing, this government overreach, them reaching into your life and these same politicians who are trying to shame us today when Trump was in office they were the same one that was saying I won't take the shot and then as soon as they get in power they're trying to make everybody do it they're the, they are hypocrites to the nth degree the devil is a liar and praise the Lord is this not America you ought to thank God and, and it's time for folk to rise up and fight for their rights because if you don't fight back they're going to take them and uh, we got to fight back because the Bible says uh, he that endureth unto the end shall be saved do I have anybody who feel like fighting up in here if you do let me hear you say yes Wow, he took the tree. Let me close this here. He took the tree and planted it in a vineyard, cultivated it, and then went out for three years looking for figs and finding none. Oh, Lord. Now, let me unpack this particular passage. It wasn't that he went out for three years. See, because it took three to five years for a fig tree to grow to the point that it would produce figs. So he waited about three to five years. And before he ever went out looking for anything, and he'd been looking for the last three years for figs but nothing had grown so it was probably somewhere between between five and eight years all together and the point that he was making was I've given you ample time to begin to produce now I want to ask you something since you've been saved oh Lord do you think that you've given God hallelujah fruit 
commiserate with your years in Christ? Or are you one of those believers who've been saved 20 years, but you still need encouragement? Are you one of those men who've been saved 10 years, but you still can't come to church but once a month? Are you one of those believers that's been saved 30 years, but you're always thinking about backsliding? Are you one of those people who've been saved five or 10 years, but you still cuss, you still lie, you're still letting it slip out, you're still fornicating, you're still falling back into the same sin. What is God getting out of his years of investment? Are you able to look at your life and say, I see fruit coming forth in me? Or are you one of them that God had been visited looking for improvement and he's still finding nothing, looking for you to get better, but he's still finding nothing. He's been looking at you, young man, ever since you got saved. You, the Lord saved you. You were caught up in homosexuality. The Lord saved you and brought you out. But 10 years later, you're still switching. Don't you think you've been saved long enough to walk like a man? Don't you think that the Lord had laid his hands on you long enough for you to get it right? I can't get any help in here. Ah, young lady. Why are you still hoeing if the Lord had brought you out? Don't you think that he's been saved long enough to come out of that behavior? Rocky, I feel like I'm preaching to myself. So since the saints won't say amen, I'm going to preach to the lights. Amen, lights. Amen, lights. That come the time when everybody got to grow. That comes a time when everyone has got to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because if you don't grow, if you won't let him improve you, if you won't come out, then sooner or later, judgment is going to come. You're not being slick. You're not getting away. You're not that smart. The Lord is giving you. He's giving you. He's giving me. He's giving us. He's giving the nation. He's giving everybody a reprieve. A reprieve is God postponing judgment. But if the Lord is giving you a reprieve, then during the reprieve, you know what you got to do. You got to improve during the reprieve. You got to get better doing the reprieve. You got to let him work on you. You got to let him sanctify you doing the reprieve. Lord, make me better doing my reprieve. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your goodness. Now let me work on myself. Let me get better, better. Oh, yeah. Look at your neighbor and ask your neighbor, what are you doing? With the Lord's reprieve in your life. Oh no, I'm just gonna stay like I am. The day, the day will come when the owner will say to the dresser, cut it down. I'm, I'm done. Look at your neighbor and say, let's bear fruit. Wave at somebody and say, let's bear fruit. Look at someone. I don't want to be too close to you. So you can point at them, use your preaching voice, and say, Oh, oh my friend, it's time to grow. It's time to get better. Yeah. Oh, oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Make me better. your hands and praise the Lord in here. God bless you, preacher.
when you know. Remember, preacher Littles, he had advantages planted in a vineyard. See, you, up Rome, this is a vineyard. You, you plant it. You plant it. You have an advantage. Because I know what you was preached to you because I do the preaching. I know what we've been talking about. I know what we've taught you. I know what the youth pastor preach. I know what the men's department promote. I know what the women promote. What a mighty move of God you all just had. I know. So then, if after all that, you just ain't going to do right, then that means that means you're going to make a mockery of God. That's the way the Lord takes that. See, what happens when you don't improve during the reprieve? It becomes a mockery. God said, okay, now you're calling me stupid. Then that's when judgment comes. Not some accident where the tower will fail. Not some politician moving against some people and killing some folk while they're on the altar. No, the judgment of God was not. The judgment of God wasn't some cogent pastors who died because they got COVID. That, that's not judgment. Judgment is those of you who won't open your church for prayer, but you'll open it up for people to get the shot. The, the Bible says that God's house shall be called the house of prayer for all men. You mean to tell me I can't pray in the church, but you'll open it? For a shot, that's judgment. Now you get mad, give yourself what you want to. That's judgment. That's judgment. That's that lack of growth will invite judgment every time. Elder so and so died, and so they went to heaven. They died in the faith. That wasn't, well, if it, I, I get so tired of people telling me, I wonder what God is trying to say to the church every time somebody dies. No, no, I wonder what God is saying by some of the things these living Negroes are doing. Right. What does God say? Well, it's judgment. We're bringing in the, 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 uh, all of these fraternities, all these sorority. We're bringing, bringing in the masons. We're bringing the devil into the house of God. Watch God's response to that stuff. At least you know where I stand. You ain't got to wonder. God says to us, I'm looking for fruit. I blessed you. I blessed you. I blessed you. I blessed you with long life. I blessed you. I blessed you. And you know what you've done? When you were sick, I healed you. And what you, you know what you did? You, now you let sisters come all in your church and people do all kinds of things and there's no rebuke, there's no correction. I raised you up. That's the kind of stuff. That's the kind of stuff that invites the judgment of God. And I don't want him to bring judgment on me because I didn't say anything. Honey, when I preach like this, this is, this is, this, this. See, I intend you, the Holy Spirit, Mother, when the Holy Spirit leads me in the areas like this, th that's when he leads me with my real amen corner. Because see, there's another amen corner. There's a shallow amen corner who will say amen to anything. And then when I, when I walk heavy, I lose that crowd. And what's bad is that you, have, you know you do it because it's a pattern. All I got to do is just turn the screw a little bit and you find everything to do but say amen. But I'm out on the ocean sailing. Out on the ocean sailing. Out on the ocean. Out on the ocean. I'm out on the ocean sailing. Out on the ocean. Out on the ocean. Give me, give me 30 seconds. Clap your hands. I can swim. I can handle it. I can do it by the help of the Lord. Yeah. Good God. 
out on the ocean out on the ocean
fill us with that Jesus joy. Not just joy till the service end, but joy that will last from Sunday to Sunday. Joy that will stay with us through the storm and rain. Joy that will keep us when we're going through. Joy that will enable us to live holy in a day like today. In the name of Jesus, Jesus, give us joy through these trying times. Joy through the tyranny of the government of the United States. Joy through medical tyranny. Joy, hey, hey Lord even through religious tyranny because churches now are turning on their own people so much for being covered in the blood so much for being washed in the name of Jesus we don't even count you unless you've been vaccinated Jesus give us power to shout through it all to praise you through it all to stay safe through it all to stay real through it all through it all through it all yeah yeah in the name of jesus fill us again lord fill us again fill us again fill us again in the name of jesus and we give you all the praise and we give you all of the glory and we give you all of the honor it's all yours it's all yours we recognize men but we glorify the lord we acknowledge leaders but we glorify jesus for he is our keeper he's the lifter of our head he strengthens us you're the one you're the one you're the one in jesus name Let's, let's make a pact, a pact to improve, a pact to grow, a pact to bear fruit. And if your neighbor don't want to bear fruit with you, bear fruit by yourself. But you bear fruit. In Jesus' name, thank God. Amen. There may be someone here who wants to be saved we have time to lead you to Jesus he will save you from your sins he will set you free the altar is open the altar is open I'm coming to the Lord preacher I want to be saved I want to be washed in the blood of the lamb well, God bless you today. Thank God. Let us make ready our offering. Let us make ready our offering. And we're going to open the doors of the church and take in our friends from Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Praise the Lord. In just a moment, Mr. and Mrs. Aaliyah Robertson. Glory to God. I'm covered by the blood. Of Jesus, get your offering ready. I'm covered by the blood of the Lamb. Oh, I'm covered by the blood of Jesus. Well, I'm covered by the blood. Well, 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 covered by the blood of the land. I'm covered by the blood of Jesus. I'm 
of the Lamb. Oh Lord, he said I'm covered by the blood. covered by the blood of Jesus. How many can say I'm covered and get a little attitude with it and say yes I am. I'm covered by the blood. The blood of Jesus. I'm covered by the Yes, I am. Hey, hey. Oh, Lord, I'm coming. Yes, I am.